again, everyone, to Natural Disasters and Human Health Live Session. Um, this live session is organized by Learning Geology. Learning Geology is a community organization that aims to promote geoscience literacy worldwide. We have a team of wonderful editors and we do promote geoscience literacy, literacy by creating a variety of content. Today's live session is one of the seven geoscience outreach live session, uh, which is a part of Sustained Geoscience Project. Uh, if you want to see recordings of all these sessions, you can simply visit our Learning Geology Facebook page or YouTube channel. So after today's live session, we have one more live session uh, to do, uh, which is going to be next week uh, on May 17th. Uh, you can see the link on screen. You can just simply go to this link and register and find more uh, details. A bit of introduction about a speaker. So first, Dr. Don uh, is a global health scientist and he is affiliated with London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine uh, and also with University of Philippines. Um, Dr. Pelin Kine is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Prince Edward Island in Canada. Um, and I am a co-founder at Learning Geology and I'm also a PhD student here at the University of Prince Edward Island in Canada. So in today's live session, um, as I explained uh, earlier, that you will learn about natural disasters, uh, what impacts uh, they leave on mental and physical health. Um, I'll stop now and I'll now hand over to Dr. Bellin Guinea to uh, please um, share her screen and... Um, and sure. Thank you so much, Kasim, for this, first of all. I'm very honored to have my uh, professor from China, back in China. He was my guider and he was my North Pole. He always directed me to the right direction, always positive. And he's a great scientist in natural disasters and disaster management, also health. So Don, uh, Professor Don currently affiliated with London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, as you mentioned, but he's been through all around the world and he's, he's leading a lot of scientists uh, with him. So I'm really honored today to have him with us. And thank you for your uh, session, Kasim, as well. I'm just gonna share my screen with everyone. And then just to give you a brief outline before I share, this is gonna be a session about uh, natural disasters, for non-scientists non as well, because we don't always have scientists joining. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about generally what is a natural disaster and then what are the natural disasters in Canada. Then I'll give a little bit information about the health impacts. Then I will give it to Professor Don so he can guide us uh, on this topic. So I'm just gonna share my screen with you. And uh, yeah, can you see my PPT? Right. Uh, I am uh, currently affiliated with uh, Canadian Centre for Climate Change and Adaptation. We are on Atlantic Canada on PEI, and this centre has uh, many grad, undergrad and graduate students working different scientific uh, topics on climate change. And we are also affiliated with the University of Prince Edward Island. So just before we start, uh, recently we had a natural disaster, uh, Hurricane Fiona affected all uh, Atlantic Canada, and we are still seeing the impacts of it physically and mentally. So just to start off, uh, natural disasters are known as mainly earthquakes, uh, volcanic eruptions, hurricanes, tornadoes. But with climate change, we are seeing some exacerbated impacts of uh, these natural disasters as well. So just to define the natural disaster, natural disaster is uh, an occurrence of natural hazard, hazard in the event that is, it is significant, significantly harming community. And that is what we mean by natural disaster. So uh, any, any disaster can uh, be resulted in poverty damage or loss of lives. Uh, if we just give some examples for natural disasters around the world globally, we can talk about uh, hurricanes, heat waves, uh, hailstorms, droughts, earthquakes, 
and um, flooding especially is very impactful in many regions around the world. And we can also talk about wildfires. And recently we have one in Canada, in Alberta, and it's hard to control that one. So uh, natural disasters in the era of climate change is especially important because yes, these disasters have been naturally happening and uh, there's no stopping to, to do natural disasters. But as climate change is happening all around the world and impacting different countries differently, we can talk about uh, impacts uh, of climate change not only impacting the average, temp average temperatures anymore, but also increasing the likelihood of uh, weather-related natural disasters around the world. So how this is really happening, uh, when the global surface temperatures increase, uh, the possibility of droughts and increased intensity of storms will likely uh, become more intense and frequent. So because the the water vapor is evaporated into the atmosphere, more powerful storms will develop eventually through the you know, uh, years. And uh, 100 year storms are gonna you know, be, start happening in 50 years or in decades. You know, this time is gonna shorten. So as more heat in the atmosphere and warmer ocean surface temperature happens, this will lead to, uh, an increase lead to an increase in wind speeds as well. And this will cause tropical storms. So if we talk a little bit about the, what kind of uh, impacts climate change actually has on the events, natural disaster events, we can start off with floods. So the connection between flooding and climate change is actually related to water and impact of water. The higher temperatures lead to increased levels of evaporation, and this is creating uh, denser clouds. And this eventually leads to heavier precipitation that can cause flooding, especially flash flooding. So more frequent and intense storms, uh, such as hurricanes, can lead to, to more flooding. And we are going to be seeing higher sea levels due to melting glaciers can also like prompt coastal flooding. And also, through storms and hurricanes, we will also experience some inland flooding. So how humans can manage water will depend on uh, better infrastructure in this case and better drainage systems. So as we mentioned, storms are impacted by climate change in the same way uh, floods are. And uh, higher temperatures will have impact on evaporation and this will lead to subsequent pre precipitation. So with clouds being holding increased amounts of water vapor, powerful storms will develop. So what happened with Fiona? Yes, we expected Fiona to happen. We predicted it. And then uh, it, it was very powerful. And these storms are going to get frequent and more intense eventually. One thing we can also talk about when it comes to climate change, uh, it will lead to extreme temperatures. So it will... In some regions of the world, it's gonna lead extremely high temperatures. And in some regions of the world, it's gonna lead extreme to low, extremely low temperatures. So if you are watching the news, this is uh, evident and uh, visible to all around uh, the world, to the, all the public. Uh, we've been seeing snowing and hailing in the regions that we have never seen these impacts before. So another impact that we can mention is, landslides. They're also connected to uh, rainfall and uh, the precipitation impact is also impacting landslides because the soil is not holding anymore. So we are losing ground. That's why it's easier to have landslides with climate change as well. And also more frequent and intense rainfalls and these events will lead to more landslides around the world as well. Some of other natural disaster types we can mention is droughts. Uh, again, higher levels of uh, evaporation le leads to eventual severe rainfall. In some regions, though, this shift will cause drier conditions due to the loss of evaporated bad water, which can lead to drought and dried out soils and loss of vegetation. We are losing uh, a lot of vegetation due to drought in many regions around the world. 
Very recently, we are experiencing in Canada, in Alberta, wildfires. So uh, wildfire season around the world is uh, becoming uh, longer. And the wildfires, because of drier soil, is uh, the vegetation around the area is becoming more flammable. And this is like a very simple connection, actually. If you have drier areas, they're more prone to wildfires. So they're going to become even more prone to wildfires. And as the snowpacks are melting earlier, meaning that this, this will cause the forests to be drier for longer periods of time, and it's going to cause uh, increasing risk of fires. Just to give a, a brief explanation uh, to what's happening in Canada, uh, we are in different uh, you know, time zones, uh, three oceans are surrounding us, and we have high mountains and areas, some plains, woods, and ton different tundra. And uh, especially when we talk about uh, Atlantic Canada, uh, most of the disasters we are seeing is uh, erosion and especially sea level rise around the area because we have low-lying regions. So this is like a classification uh, that the government Canada has on their website. So mainly Canada is seeing this type of uh, natural disasters. We have earthquakes, floods, hail, and like uh, we are losing sea ice. We have landslides, uh, avalanches, tornadoes, tsunamis, and storm surges, eruptions, and winter storms. So they are defining the um, natural disasters and like giving some examples to these uh, disasters. So it's easy to reach to this kind of information through the website. So what happened in my region in Atlantic Canada here is that we had uh, what really harmed to the Atlantic Canadian communities. We had Hurricane Fiona and uh, this damage to people's houses, uh, people's, we had some casualties and uh, we had some damage to the environment, especially we had a lot of trees down. So this was the recent example of natural disaster in Atlantic Canada. We had a lot of uh, damage and we have also a lot of economical damage. This is one of the pictures that I can share. And uh, so threats to coastal communities is very high here if, if you talk about the natural disasters. And uh, long-term risks of coastal erosion and sea level rise is still to be uh, predicted and projected. To wrap it up, uh, how public health is impacted through these disasters is usually the impact is on population size and the way of life. Directly, some of these disasters can be uh, resulted in uh, injuries, serious injuries. Uh, we are needing more uh, medical care. We have higher risk of communicable diseases. Let's call it water contamination. If we have our water contaminated, it's gonna be easier to have diseases. And then uh, we have uh, damage to medical facilities and we have damage to water infrastructure as well. And eventually what can happen in a community is lack of food, and uh, forced migration. So migration, uh, loss of sense of home can also cause mental repercussion, repercussions in people. So if you are losing your property or you're losing a pet or you're losing a loved one, this is gonna definitely impact you mentally. So there's another table that I would like to share quickly is, we are gonna look into the mental and physical health a little bit. So physical trauma can uh, happen with falls, lacerations, burns, strains, and sprains. And then communicable disease side usually starts with the intestinal infections and respiratory infections. And when we talk about the infectious diseases, we can talk about open, frac open fractures, vector bone diseases, and some other local diseases. However, what I'm really interested in is mental health impacts of uh, natural disasters. Uh, immediate impacts includes, of course, shock and grief. And what happened to us in, during Fiona is also we were shocked. Like we woke up in the morning and what we couldn't believe what we saw. 
and then we were out of power for uh, weeks. So we lost homes, businesses, some people, you know, lost their loved ones. Uh, so these kind of uh, traumatic events can uh, result in post-traumatic disorders, depression, and anxiety. So in the long term, natural disasters will uh, drive an increase in also alcohol and substance abuse in people, in some populations. So what are we expecting is like when these mental impacts can actually start occurring, and then we can look into the time span of like two uh, in the in the coming weeks, in the recent weeks, to the months following a disaster. And these are long term impacts, like they're not uh, very easy to mitigate. Just to touch a little bit on the prevention and mitigation of uh, natural disasters. I would like to say that without any kind of coordinated response, there is no uh, success on mitigation or prevention of these events. So many manage uh, disaster management experts around the world are uh, trying to minimize the suffering of people, and uh, they are trying to promote uh, a community recovery in uh, one sense. So uh, what is very important is how to be ready, how to respond, and how to recover from these events. Because the damage of the disaster create uh, a lot of uh, damage, mental damage and physical damage also on the, on the public, public health. And what we can do is to raise awareness about potential hazards, and we try to address them better to the public and how to properly prepare will also play an important role in this uh, disasters. So what I really want to say uh, to scientists and non-scientists around the world who are listening to us is that we have to have an impactful emergency plan to actually you know, recover from the either mental or physical impacts of uh, these disasters. So we have to make a plan, yes, but we have to also put this plan to action. So we can have better emergency shelter sites and evacuation routes, but also very importantly, we, could, we should have a better chain of command in the community and communication procedures should be improved and there should be more training programs for the people before, before a disaster. Like we can also, you know, in the, in the event of Fiona, we could pre-prepare and like not wait until the last moment but people don't really expect the damage before like it happens. And then we start adapting like we are doing in Atlantic Canada now. So just five steps of emergency preparedness I'd like to just mention here. A better, you know, like risk assessment, we need to involve the community. If everybody is aware of the situation or we know the risks of our zone, then we are on the right direction. And uh, we have to identify what we have, what we don't have, weaknesses and strengths and develop uh, response strategies and implement a plan, take action. Just to share this before, during and after an emergency, as I mentioned, a response plan is very important. During an emergency, it's very important to have an emergency plan and after we need to assess the damage and act accordingly. I'd like to thank you for your time to everybody. And since we are going to have a question and answer session after this, I would like to uh, give the lead to Professor Don, if he's ready. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Berlin, uh, for the amazing presentation. You're welcome. Um, I'll ask now uh, Dr. Don to um, share um, his presentation. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, that was a very good uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Pelin. Uh, it's good that you are moving forward with your career in this field. Thank you. I have known Pelin uh, when she was a PhD student at the University of Liverpool. And thank you very much to the organizers of this event. This is very important. Uh, I am the, so I, I work with the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine and disasters is one of my research areas. And 
what is important also is that um, I am the editor in chief of Public Health Challenges, which is a journal of Wiley and the deputy editor in chief of Global Health Research and Policy of BMC. And I really keep on pushing young scientists like you and the, the emerging scientists among the audience that I'll be very happy to publish with you papers. And I, I would encourage Pelin know this, that as, or as young as you are, keep on publishing because not only because of your career when you publish uh, papers, because we are creating evidence so that we can uh, translate it to policy and practice. That is very important. So the, the audience here and the ones who will be seeing this um, presentation uh, do get my contacts later on so that we can um, you can work with me on papers that we will publish on disasters. So Pelin already mentioned a number of very important things. What I want to start with uh, as mentioned by the moderator, I'm currently here in Manila, Philippines. And 10 years ago, we had the super typhoon. And this was seen in the satellite. And th this was over the Pacific Ocean. So since this is basically about geology, we know very well that you will see that there is um, real geological evidence. I mean, location-wise, uh, disasters are predictable where they would be. So for example, because of the, of the structure of the earth, we would have more typhoons in, in these areas of the world because of the warming of the oceans. And, and this is exactly what happened 10 years ago with Typhoon Haiyan. And unfortunately, some countries, some locations of the world will get more disasters and some will not. So for example, you will see there the map of the Philippines, you have uh, Vietnam, China, Taiwan, and Japan. That's the uh, route of all the storms plotted. There is predictability. And unfortunately, for some locations, you will just be getting a lot of storms and a lot of typhoons year in, year out. So in the Philippines, there will be uh, 20 at the average. And you will always hear even in... Um, um, Taiwan, and of course, Japan. And eventually, of course, when they hit the land, once the storm would reach to the mainland of Asia, it becomes weaker. So that's why they, you don't see anymore the effect of the storms when they start hitting the land because it goes up and down, goes up and down. So location um, sort of determines where uh, the disasters would happen. And of course, the differences of the economies, the way countries are, are uh, set up with their disaster management. So if a rich country has a lot of money to spare, they will have better ways of preventing, mitigating, and addressing the disaster. So in other words, uh, technology, which also has to be paid, developed, having scientists like the research center of, 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 of Berlin um, would really predict whether it will become a disaster or not. So we will, uh, we will review what Berlin mentioned about disasters. So that's one thing. And Super Typhoon Haiyan or Yolanda, by the way, there are different names of, of typhoons. There's the international name, and then there is the, the local name so that people will understand it better. And also, you know, the, type, the names of typhoons of, cannot be repeated. If the effect is very strong, it will not, the name will not be used anymore. And it is alphabetical. And every country will contribute a name to the database on what names will be used for every typhoon. So it's just for, your, um, for our audience here who are interested in disasters. So unfortunately, I come from Tacloban. That's where the orange line is. And it was the one of the worst hit uh, by the super typhoon, which started to develop in the Pacific Ocean. And that is the route of the typhoon when it happened 10 years ago. And this was the effect the following day. It was um, very quick, early morning until, um, until uh, the, the, the early part of the day. And the devastation is really massive that it just um, 
affected everything. This used to be a thriving part of the of the island, and it was totally washed out because of both the wind and, of course, the tsunami that is a result of of the strong forces. So you see the airport there at the edge, and this was a very crowded community. So that's why it caused a lot of attention globally 10 years ago. Uh, most of the countries provided support to the country and especially to this area. And nothing was spared by the disaster. There were lots of deaths. I have many family members and, and friends who died and communication lines were down, electricity were down, there was no food, and it resulted into chaos eventually after the typhoon. So 6,000 plus deaths, 1,700 was missing, and 27,000 injured. That's massive impact of a certain disaster. And of course, because the, 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 the effect is wider, it's 14 million people affected, including the ones affected by by the lack of um, affected agriculture, uh, food will be affected, the supply. And there are more vulnerable populations whenever a disaster happens. In my research, it was not actually um, the children. The children were the priorities of families. It was the elderly and the person with disabilities. They were based on the narratives of, of our interviews it was the elderly who were not, um, who were just asked to be left behind at their homes. My goodness, even if I keep on read, going back to the narratives of the interviews that we did, it still make it still affects me that it's just so strong the effect of disasters. And I would suppose it will be the same with other disasters in the world, whether it's earthquake in in many countries like in Nepal, or recently the ones in um, in Turkey. And of course, when it's someone closer to you, it becomes more impactful and it becomes, uh, it, it, it really becomes uh, more painful to the families uh, who are affected. So 3.9 million forced from their homes and people were evacuated and a lot of money was poured into, the, uh, into helping the, the disaster uh, victims. There were deaths all over that they just cannot bury the dead. Imagine uh, 6,000 died, and after one day being a tropical country, it will start smelling. And then this, that's the airport where the, um, they wanted to fly, but the, the, fl the flights were not able to land. And so in such things, the details of disasters, re unless you are a scientist who would go through the details of it, you'll not be able to grasp, for example, you just have to dig um, holes just to dump all the dead bodies. And I, I want to do a paper on this, on how dead bodies are, are, um, um, are taken care of during disasters because this is very important. The WHO has protocols in doing this, especially when there's a lot of dead bodies all over. Though the dead would not be the priority, I would suppose it would be the living. So after a few days, there, there's no more food, no more water. Guess what happens? There's a lot of looting. So all the stores that were closed, they just had to ransack it and also all the, the department stores. The people had no choice because um, these are islands and it was very difficult to uh, bring in support during the first uh, few uh, days after the disaster. And even the soft drinks plant, that's the best way where they, that's the best place where they could get um, something to drink. Probably they just had a lot of soft drinks during that time for some people who just uh, went to the plant. And of course, like in any other disaster, help would start coming in, but sometimes there's a delay because of the, of the lack of infrastructure to, to uh, spread the support. And the roads are all covered with just many things that you cannot easily distribute things. So that's the crucial part in any disaster, especially uh, humanitarian crisis. So this is an example of what happened, uh, which is closer to my heart. As, as Belinda mentioned, so a disaster becomes a disaster when the society is not able to cope with it. If the society is able to cope with it, 
you won't call that a disaster. So that's why we don't hear much from, for example, countries like Japan, because they have very good infrastructure. But for the developing countries, it is a bit difficult because um, there's just the health system is just not that strong that they are not able to, um, to provide all the support when disasters happen. So there are vulnerabilities in societies. If they are not able to address, to face the risk, shock, or stress, then that is a highly vulnerable society. So therefore, before any disaster happens, there should be a preparation to address the vulnerability of the disaster. For example, if the area is prone to, um, to earthquakes, then therefore the structures of the building should be strong and there will be strong guidelines on building these structures. If there's always tsunami or flooding, houses and, and, and residential areas should be away from this. So that's to lessen the vulnerability. And then there are hazards. So hazards are naturally occurring physical phenomena. So they're geophysical, hydrological, climatological, and biological. There are natural and there are man-made hazards. So for this uh, uh, lecture, we are just talking about uh, natural hazards. So they will always be there, the hazards. However, it's the way the society address uh, and, 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 and deal with these hazards if they are good in dealing with these hazards, then it doesn't become a disaster. So it, it's just a normal day-to-day -day thing. So that's why um, I did my PhD in the UK. Whenever we have a very strong uh, snowfall, the whole country is paralyzed. Nothing can be done. And then you go to Norway, they have like uh, three meters of snow. Everything is normal, as in nothing is happening. So it really depends on the society on how they are able to deal with the hazards. Uh, Pelin mentioned that there are different kinds of natural disasters, wildfires, uh, different types of disasters. Armed conflict, of course, is, is man-made. Now, when it comes to frequency, um, you will see that storm would be the most frequent of all. And it has already been mentioned that with, the, with climate change, it will still get more and more frequent. But remember, climate change also has to do with droughts, with floods, and so they are all interrelated. Therefore, we will be seeing more of these disasters in the coming years and decades if we will not start addressing climate change. And other human-related disasters will also be a part of the cascade of all these disasters. So second comes uh, floods when it comes to frequency. And we also see that there's an increasing number of events reported every year as the time went by. And of course, but now of course we have a very good uh, reporting systems. So we have seen this, that the number of natural disasters in the world is increasing. So therefore we will be putting more money and investments on addressing disasters. And that's, a lot of money that we have to channel from many other areas, which where they are also needed. But then again, if we don't address it, human societies will be affected if we don't invest on addressing disasters. And the number of people affected, of course, gets bigger more as many more disasters are occurring globally. And the, the total estimated cost of natural disasters, the impact is also getting higher. The cost is getting, uh, it's getting more expensive because the trend is increasing. And so therefore it will eat a lot of budgets from the governments. And we are going to discuss more health, uh, the health problems of natural disasters. So you have the deaths, risk of uh, orthopedic disabilities, mental health, infrastructure damages, of course. It, well, it's not health, but it will affect if the health uh, infrastructure affected, infectious diseases as the cascade goes on, and famine. When it comes to mortality, it is the earthquake that causes a lot of death because um, it is more, it is massive and they, it is sudden that people just kind of run away, uh, run at once, 
when the earthquake happens as compared to flood because it will take time and, and same with the storm. So when it comes to mortality, it's the earthquake that causes a lot of death. When it comes to economic issues, it is the flood that affects uh, most because of the massive scale of the water when it happens. It's sudden and it affects agriculture, it affects houses, infrastructure, roads. Uh, so the economic issues, it's the flood followed by earthquakes. So you see, uh, there are nuances with the different disasters. So by the way, those who are interested in these slides, I'll be happy to share with you. you I will share my email later on. And if you look at different disasters, there are uh, ways of measuring the effect. And the, so you can measure the cost and the number of affected. So there are different variations. It can be very, very expensive, like uh, the one in, in Japan, even if the number of people affected will be lesser. So there are differences. And this actually would be a very good study looking at local disasters in your countries so that we can compare the impact and have evidence on the impact of all of these disasters. So the characteristics of natural disasters, there's economic loss, uh, large numbers of people affected, and they mostly impact on the low and middle income countries. So it becomes a major burden to all these, uh, to the poorer countries in the world. And unfortunately, it's the poor who are most vulnerable because it's the poor who has um, weak, uh, weakly built houses, it's the poor who are the fringes of the society living by the sea or by the rivers. And, and so therefore more harm is done on them. When it comes to mental health issues, it's the post-traumatic stress disorder that affects them. There's depression because of the prolonged agony and hopelessness that happens to them. And of course, so the most important issue is to help people as rapidly as possible to rebuild their lives and their social networks. So in my studies, in my research, social networks is very important. It's a social capital. So a family that has more social network, for example, family in other families in other places which are not affected or abroad, they're able to support them at once or they can, they're able to move at once to, to, to some of their relatives. And then a lot of resources are being poured to the family who are affected. So social networks is very important in, in, in the survival of those who are affected by the disasters. And when we, when we address health effects of natural disasters, there should be a lot of involvement of external partners from the funders to the ones delivering the services. And it should be done in a cooperative uh, relationship. The problem with one of the challenges in addressing disaster is that everyone wants to help. All countries would want to send their ships and their planes. However, no one is coordinating all the efforts and everyone is just doing things. And some communities are the ones much to help, but there are other communities which are left behind. So therefore there should be a strong coordination when, there is, uh, when they are delivering services to uh, communities affected by disasters so that there will be equal uh, way of addressing all the services and all the communities affected. And there are different ways of analyzing. We have many protocols and we have many ways of analyzing and coping with natural disasters. There are many resources online and this is just a one of them. And so we always have to prepare disaster, uh, prepare for disasters. As I mentioned earlier, we have to identify vulnerabilities of the population and we have to look at different scenarios. What if this happens? What if the flood would go higher? What if the flood will be this strong? What do we do without? And then outline the role of the different actors so that there will be no duplication of actions. And of course, there will always be training and responders and, and managers during disasters. So when addressing mental health and psychosocial support in emergency settings, there are, it, it's one of the most um, challenging uh, ways, one, one of the most challenging things to be, that has to be addressed in a disaster. Because uh, for some people, it, though it is a priority, it is not one of the priorities in terms of budgeting. 
However, it is indeed important that mental health and psychosocial support should be provided. And there should be uh, social considerations in, in delivering the basic services. And of course, there will be specialized services if there are indeed uh, major mental health issues happening within uh, uh, an area affected by the disaster. There should be assessment and surveillance so that we can monitor what's happening. In, when, when there is a disaster, and also because of the displacement of populations, there should be a coordination of all the activities. And in addressing the future challenges in meeting the health needs of natural disasters, you always have to prevent the negative health impacts. And we have seen lack of standard approaches in doing this. And of course, uh, being a health economist, we should have cost-effective interventions when addressing disasters. Um, a disaster program is normally a one to two year master program. We're just doing this lecture in just a few minutes. So we will just be very quick and fast with what we're saying. Um, there is an important framework, the Sendai framework, which outlines seven global targets so that we can substantially reduce, for example, the global disaster mortality instead of just addressing what's happening, which was the the way the paradigm of addressing disasters before a disaster happens, we address it. Now, because of the Sendai framework, we address even before a disaster happens to this, uh, decrease global disaster mortality, reduce the number of affected people globally, reduce the direct economic loss, and reduce the disaster damage of critical disaster, a critical infrastructure and, and disruption of basic services. Then we have to increase the number of countries with national and local disaster risk reduction strategies. It's now being done in most of the countries. Enhance international cooperation because sometimes some countries are not able to deal with the disasters when it happens. International cooperation is needed. And of course, increase the availability and access to multi-hazard early warning systems. For example, for the tsunami in the Pacific Ocean, we have a very good system with that which informs all the countries around the Pacific Ocean. So thank you very much for listening. We'll be happy to answer your questions. And this is my contact if you want to uh, work with me on writing papers and research in disasters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Don. We appreciate this and everything you did today. We know we have another session. so. Kasim, I think we have a couple of questions. Maybe we can just try to yeah. answer. Thank you so them. much, uh, Dr. John, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pellin. Um, so we are in um, Q&A session now. So if you have any questions for Dr. Don or Dr. Pellin, please, you can comment down um, your questions for them. So we have uh, two questions. Um, first question is from um, Ken. Uh, Pellin, what do you think about urban heat dome? How it affect temperature changes? Nice question. I actually wrote about this. <laughs> All right, so it is, uh, I'll just like to answer briefly. Uh, it is very uh, important, uh, the urban heat impact around the world because mainly uh, especially in the cities during the daytime because the built environments is uh, usually warmer by the way that it's built such as concrete glass and asphalt abs absorb a lot of solar radiation rather than reflecting it so this is compounded by the lack of shade in many urban areas which is often due to the lack of trees so uh, that's why the greenness impact is very important. So trees actually cool down the land surface. And this is a research uh, result by the temperature. They can cool down the temperature by 12, up to 12 degrees centigrade. So imagine that impact. So if you have a lot of concrete and if you don't have any trees around the city, you're going to have much more extreme heat than other areas. 
So while the rural areas are having less, less, less and less heat because they have more vegetation, greenness, the urban areas are going to trap the, the heat. That's why we call it uh, urban heat impact. So uh, how it's going to impact us if we don't take any precaution or make the cities greener is that we are going to have more uh, extreme temperatures around the cities. And that's going to impact the, you know, the people of the city mainly. Let's talk about Toronto. You know, it's just a concrete city. We don't see much green. And when we talk about Prince Edward Island, we have more forests. So just to, you know, give you an example of what is the city built of? You know, China is very good at this. They're very, they are very much paying attention to building greener areas and green, green buildings even. So they have a concept of green buildings now. So I could answer that question that way. So if we take precautions, we can reduce the heat impact up to 12 degrees. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. We have another question. We are talking about natural disasters in quotation marks. Are they really natural or human made? We are exploiting the big, big blue marble as humans. Professor Don, would you like to answer this question? Sure. Um, just in well, there we just classify two kinds of disasters just for easy classification. So if those that are um, human errors, human human made, for example, uh, nuclear disasters, uh, they call it. Of course, eventually, what's happening is is it, it's a natural phenomenon. I mean, there is really nothing uh, human disaster unless it's. Uh, it's a bombing or a terroristic attack or something. But it, when, when we say it's, it's natural, it's, it was not directly uh, done by, by, by humans. Uh, however, they are interrelated. So climate change is because of, 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 of humans what, that they have been doing. And the cascade eventually uh, goes uh, further that, that it, it affects other forms of so we can see that it's it's a bit uh, hazy line, and at the end of the day, the message is we just have to take care of our mother Earth. There's only one Earth, you know. You know, there's just one that distance from the sun that we can all survive, and be if you be, if the Earth is near the sun, we cannot survive. If it's be if it's beyond uh, the current distance now. We also will not survive. We will not freeze. So that's why I, I, I read, I, I heard, uh, I watched a video that said that if we can only bring our global politicians and our national leaders uh, to the space lab, they can see, they will realize that we just have one Earth. And, and if we don't take care of it, so meaning humans are the ones uh, causing all these problems, then that's the only way we can save it. So wars, uh, conflicts, I don't know why we have to annihilate ourselves. We're the only ones living in this planet. I think that's the message that we have to, that that we have we are trying to show in this in this webinar. As for me, that's what I want to do in my research. We have to take care of biodiversity. We have to take care of of the impact of having greens in in urban areas. And, and I agree with Pauline that indeed China, for example, um, they don't build their buildings. Uh, even cockroaches in, in some cities cannot go in between buildings because every single space is, is a, there's something being built, but there should be spaces so th for greens. And the, the beauty of being a scientist in, 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 in this area is that you can go for the details of, of all, there's so many things that would contribute to disasters, for example, or the impact of disasters. I just came from Kazakhstan. The glaciers there are, are melting and it's affecting the, the populations in the urban areas. It's affecting the, the climate. It's affecting the vegetation, so on and so forth. And then in many other countries, there, um, when, when flooding, go, when the water goes um, higher, the brackish water, for example, keeps on changing. And so when seawater goes in, then it affects the, the, the fishes and, and the vegetation within the, there are so many details that we can do as, as, as researchers and scientists. Yeah. 
Thank you so much for your answer to this question. Yes. Do we have other questions, Kasim? Thank you, uh, Dr. John. Um, we don't have any questions, uh, just general uh, comments from people. Thank you. Um, thanking you, Dr. John and Dr. Pellin, for your uh, presentations. So we have uh, more five minutes. If you have any questions, uh, please let us know. Um, you can comment down your questions for Dr. John or Dr. Pellin. Or, or we can just add while you are uh, look while you're reading some of the comments. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, disaster is becoming very expensive. I mean, addressing disasters. And we are the ones putting the bills for this. It comes from our budget. It comes from our taxes. So it becomes very, very expensive to build all this infrastructure. So that's why disaster financing is actually a, a very good field for some of you who are interested um, looking at how we will be financing disasters. And one of the major discussions, for example, at the global level is, should we have a global fund for disasters? Because normally when a disaster happens, we scramble for money, we look for it, and, and no one wants to give. So why don't we have a, a fund that is similar to the global fund for HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria, where we just tap the money and then we get it from there? Or, for example, what we can tap the money for if a, if a country is affected by climate change, the Pacific Island countries and the, and other and the Indian Ocean uh, countries, they can tap from such money. But we, we still do not have that uh, kind of facility because it is now very, very expensive. So instead of waiting for immediate help from countries, which sometimes just donate a small amount of money, we will have a funding facility for this. So I hope the global community will start thinking about this so that we will have access to such uh, money. I would like to ask, Pelin, I'm curious about your research sure. center. Um, what, what does your research center do? Uh, we have uh, a lot of subjects that many people are looking into. Like we, our group, we have uh, uh, hurricane scientists, we have groundwater specialists like Cass Cousin, and then uh, we have coastal uh, erosion. Uh, who, we have people who look at, at the coastal erosion and ice cover. And like mainly most of the climate issues that we are kind of like taking into account there. Uh, we are we are into uh, flood modeling, climate modeling. Uh, we have different weather stations around the island that we are actually monitoring the weather and kind of uh, checking the storm events like storm surge. So it's it's really active at the moment. And we have a great mentor, Professor Xander Wang, who is leading all of us in this. So we are all kind of like specializing in different areas. Uh, recently, I'm looking into uh, climate policy that I'm trying to, you know, become more of an ex expert in that, especially when we look into the Hurricane Fiona impacts. I'm trying to uh, look into the mental health impacts in the PI population. So the islanders, hopefully soon we will have some interviews and surveys with them, just like I did in uh, China, back in China, get their perceptions and, you know, awareness uh, level and how do they feel about the mental uh, toll of uh, Hurricane Fiona. So it's all very exciting thing, things going on there. And we would really, really like you to, you know, uh, join us someday over there. Very good. I look forward to uh, receive your papers so that we can publish them. I think it is really very important uh, to emphasize that we should publish at once findings and we should just keep on writing even just commentaries and perspectives because that's the way we just keep on the discussion of disasters, its impact at the global level. Exactly. Uh, because it just gets forgotten. A new disaster comes, the previous, there's one thing I've noticed in, in global disaster uh, thing. When a disaster comes, everyone is there. But when a new disaster happens, uh, even funding is forgotten with the previous yes. disaster. Yes. That's, that's, that would be an interesting paper to write on, for example. And I'm happy with that research area that you are doing. And last question for you. Who, who funds your research center and your projects? 
Uh, we are uh, mainly funded by government and uh, we have some private uh, funding as well. But uh, I would like to mention, and I, I, before we finish, I know you have to go to another session that I want to also ask you and get your opinion in one uh, aspect of mental health uh, impacts of such disasters. What do you think about the community communal support on a region when a disaster happens? And I'm not sure how Philippines dealing with this, but a chain of command or, you know, a commun community support, if we have the support between the neighborhoods or the, you know, general, general public, do you think mental health impacts can be lessened or how this kind of support from each other can help us cope with that kind of uh, yeah, that is aftermath. actually a, That is a very, very interesting concept. It is happening to some extent, but not as defined as that because uh, resilience uh, is based on, at the it should be at the community level. So therefore strengthening at that level by, uh, by having support systems between communities, not only families, would really be a good approach. And I, I know they are doing that, but of course it's very challenging, especially when it's uh, low income communities where it is not a priority. I know it is on paper that there will be trainings on that, but that would be a good research area and I'm challenged to look into that and probably publish papers. We'll get back to you in the near future. So this is not the end of our discussion. That would be great because I know you have a great team behind you to all around the world and it would be good to get some you know, uh, information from your team as well about this because it's very important to, you know, publish something about the support system in a community and how this can help mental health impacts. Yeah, I think. Do we have other questions, Kasim? Or No, uh, we don't have any uh, further questions. Um, thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Don and Dr. Pelin. Thank and I'd so also much. like to thank all the viewers to attend and ask interesting questions. Um, uh, I am very grateful to have uh, both of these speakers, especially Dr. Don, as he's joining us from um, Manila, uh, and it's 9 a.m. in the morning. So thank you so much, Dr. Don. Um, and uh, that's it. And I'd like to now finish this session. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Have a good day, everyone.